You're actually going to get two speeches for the price of one today. My name is Justin Williams, and I'm going to talk to you about the high price of big oil, which is a big economic driver in the United States. But the, the victims of big oil can be any one of us, and I'm going to talk to you about that, and I'm also going to talk to you about each of you. Individualism and exceptionalism, and why what I do for oil field workers and landowners and people that are mistreated by big industry matters to you or should matter to you. When I started out in high school, and I will tell you it was back in the turbulent 60s and, well, the 70s, but I grew up partly in the 60s, and I, like a lot of people, wanted to change the world. But I was interested in philosophy. My grandmother was a school teacher. She taught me to read at an early age. I loved to read. I loved American history. But I liked to hunt and fish, and the idea of living in a log cabin appealed to me. So I wanted to be a forest ranger. I would never be up here talking to you today if I'd been a forest ranger. But what happened to change that was I went to the guidance counselor when I was a junior in high school, and I found out that for every applicant for actually the forest ranger job that I wanted to be able to hunt and fish and live in a log cabin and talk to bears and wolves instead of people, I was really bad at talking to girls back then. So instead of doing that, there were 14,000 applicants for each one of those jobs, and you had to have a college education, and I didn't want to go to college. That's why I wanted to be a forest ranger. And 40% of the jobs in the forest rangery field were fighting fire, forest fires, which sounded two things to me, really dangerous and really hot. Here we are in Phoenix in June, you know, July. So I, um, I put aside my desire to be a forest ranger, and what I did is I got a political science degree and became a lawyer. And instead of talking to bears and wolves, I talked to <laughs> lawyers. A lot of people say there aren't any difference, so. I was attracted uh, to the founding fathers in, in American history a lot by individualism and exceptionalism. The fact that all these people were able to, were willing to stand up and give their one life for something they believed in, and that is what finally attracted me to the law, that I could do something that made a difference. But then what happened on my way to making a difference is I got good grades in law school. It was unbelievable to me, but I did really well. So instead of going out and changing the world, I got a job with the Blue Blood Law Firm, one of the two oldest firms in the state of Texas. And you know who we represented? Big insurance companies, big oil companies. I'm the English who represented still today about 90% of the world's shipping. And we were an old firm and we were better than anybody else. We were the elite. We were smarter than anybody else. All you had to do was ask us. <laughs> and I didn't change the world for a long time. I became a great trial lawyer, tried a lot of cases and won them, but something always bothered me because I wasn't a Kool-Aid drinker. And let me tell you what I mean by Kool-Aid drinker. Somebody's talking on, uh, and I'm glad they're giving a speech on it, on uh, Guyana and Jim Jones and all, but Kool-Aid drinkers are people that buy one, in, in my world, one side of the argument without objectively looking at the other. My firm always took the position our clients were right. There was no other side. The other side, the lawyers on the other side weren't as good as us. Uh, they certainly couldn't outspend us, that was for sure. But it always bothered me because I thought a lot of times our clients did things that were wrong. I had sympathy for people that were hurt and eventually uh, I ended up after a battle with cancer and something you don't want to hear about, uh, recovering, I stopped representing any of those people. And what I do now is I represent injured oil field workers. I represent people uh, who are cheated by the oil industry. And I represent people who have uh, their land 
are their lives damaged by the oil industry or chemical companies and things like that. Why does that matter to you? Well, let me tell you something that happened about 30 years ago. When I was representing, back representing oil companies, I would give you an example. Mobile oil company, before they merged with Exxon, had a lawyer who was a New Yorker, and I loved that guy. You know what he would do? He managed all their litigation, and twice a year he would go. Mobile had moved from New York to outside of Washington, D.C. and Virginia, and he would go try a case twice a year. And his reasoning was, how can I manage lawyers who are actually trial lawyers if I don't know how to do it myself? But he didn't hire law firms, he hired lawyers. He didn't hire my law firm, he hired me. In 1989, a mobile lawyer told me that they would always hire these blue blood firms because it was very, very safe. In 93, they pulled all their cases and sent them to me. And it was because of individualism. What happened in America is we started to look at each other as members of groups. All of you here today are members of a great group, Menza. You've earned that, but you've earned it by your individual ability. And if you're only recognized as a member of Menza, then you're not the best you can be. You know, we look at each other as Democrats or Republicans, as liberals or conservatives, as right or left-handed. In fact, a lot of you look at each other as Patriot fans or Cowboy fans. I'm from Texas, obviously. Um, the problem with that is we all have one life to live. We only have that one life. And you don't do it as well as you could if you're a member of a group living it. Why does that matter to corporate America? Because they can control you if they can categorize you, if they can scan you, if they can put you into a box, then they can control your public opinion, they can, they can do focus groups, they can advertise one of the big mind controllers in America. That's what the oil and gas industry does. They tell everybody how important they are to the success of America, and we buy it without looking at the cost. It's an incredible cost in human tragedy, and the, the problem with it is we can all make a difference. When I was representing oil companies and working for a big blue blood firm, what did I like about it? The things we all like about being members of groups like that. We were smarter than everybody else, as I said, just ask us. We also got to be members of country clubs, and we played golf at highfalutin golf clubs. And we went to social events, and we were the social elite. That was fun for a kid that was raised in a union family with a union worker for a stepfather and stay-at-home mom and didn't have a lot of money. That was also one of the things that kind of dissuaded me from being a firefighter. I found out they only made about $30,000 a year. and I had lived on that kind of life and it was, I wanted a little bit more so that, that made it, being a lawyer, a little bit more attractive. But it wasn't the main driving point. As I said, I've combined these two speeches so I've got to find my place at a time. Um, when the other thing that happened, let me get back on course, was that 30 years ago, the Ivy League, and my wife is from the Northeast, and I'm from Texas, and she has a lot more respect for the Ivy League, and a lot of you may be Ivy Leaguers here, and I don't mean to demean you if you are, but the Ivy League business schools came up with a very, very smart marketing tool. They marketed MBAs that if you get an MBA from Ivy League school, if you can manage the corner convenience store, you can manage IBM. It changed corporate America, not for the best. Halliburton had never been run by somebody that didn't come up through the ranks of Halliburton, who knew what they, they affectionately called that company Big Red. They cared about their workers. They cared about the, the job and, and making it safe until they got run by Dick Cheney and bean counters. 
Westinghouse had always had the best electrical engineers in the world. They made great electrical engineering products and they had great thinkers. Then they hired a guy named Michael Jordan and I used to represent Westinghouse and I said that the reason they hired Michael Jordan, they wanted to beat GM, G, General Electric at uh, corporate basketball, but they hired the wrong Mark, Michael Jordan. And they didn't hire the basketball player, they hired a VP at PepsiCo who had inspired the ad campaign of Pepsi Generation. Let me ask you a quick question. Has anybody seen a Westinghouse product in the last 10 years? There ain't no more Westinghouse because the only Westinghouse brands you see out there are licensed to the Chinese and they aren't made by electrical engineers in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That hurt corporate America because they stopped caring about their employees and when they stopped caring about their employees, they stopped caring about you and they stopped caring about me. They also, one of the things that happened in the insurance industry, it used to be that insurance was a very, it was a fairly simple concept. They insured against risk. And if risk didn't occur, they made a lot of money. If risk did occur, they need to minimize them, but they didn't deny them. And then someone came along and said, how do we make money even if risk occur? You know what has come into the American vernacular is a term called personal responsibility, and we all believe in it. But personal responsibility used to mean that you were in charge of what you were able to, af to affect. The job that you were able to do, not the entire environment. Personal responsibility was used to change the litigation playing field and make corporate America not responsible for their part of the job. It was the injured worker who was responsible. It was the landowner who hadn't taken proper precautions. It was the investor who didn't get proper information. They were all, we were brainwashed. And you know what they told us? If we find for the victim, it'll cost each of us in our pocketbook. That's not true. If you know how the insurance industry works and how reinsurance and reinsurance it is, it can't affect you as much as you think it can. It can't affect you hardly at all. <coughs> so they changed the playing field. One of the statistics that nobody ever hears about is how many lawsuits are won by how many lawsuits are won by the defense? People, not people getting these million dollar verdicts, but people who go to trial, go to court, and get zero. Statistically, for every person who gets a dollar, 1,000 people get zero. For every person who gets a million dollars, 10,000 people get zero. Why is that important? Because corporate America can beat 95% of the people do what I do because they hire really those blue blood law firms with those smart lawyers, but they don't just hire a little of them, they hire a lot of them. They put 20, 30, 40 of them on a case and they can outspend you and they can outspend me and they do. So the playing field gets tilted. Why does it matter to you? Because if they can do it to you, they can do it. If they can do it to workers, if they can do it to, to landowners, if they can do it to people investing, they can do it to any of us. One of the differences between individualism and groupthink is we get in every part of our life, every day, we get bombarded by being a member of a group. When I was growing up and reading about American history and the freedoms and the rights that we were all brought up with, I would never have believed that Americans would be like sheep led to a slaughter. But you know what we all do on the way to Phoenix just about or every day or at least once or twice a year? We go through TSA and we're virtually strip searched and nobody objects, nobody says anything about it, nobody complains. I complained once and they put me in the back of the line, taught me a lesson. You know, the thing is you don't they, they don't want you to be an individual. They don't want you to speak out. They don't want you, they want you to be a member of a group.
taglines were created that allowed uh, advertising. I want to give you some taglines, and if people talk to you about this, ask them about it. If you hear the term tort reform from any of it's lot, it's really used a lot by the Chamber of Commerce and, and the national organization. Lawsuit abuse, frivolous lawsuits. You know, I was hired to do major cases, but I also did some small cases. I never saw a frivolous lawsuit. I never saw somebody. You know, when you file a lawsuit and you are willing to go forward to, to take somebody on, it's not easy. You know what they're going to do? They're going to look at everything you did in life, and if you've ever made a mistake, they're going to blame you for that mistake. If you have ever done anything wrong, they're going to dig up the dirt on you, and they're going to say everything that, everything that is, you're claiming is not the result of their fault, but what you did in life that was wrong. So people don't just bring a lawsuit just because they think they're going to get a lot of money. Because what do you think all those lawyers on the other side are doing? They're trying to keep you from getting that money. It's not an easy thing. So I've never seen frivolous lawsuits. But think about this. If a corporation, you know they don't do this. But if they cut safety corners to save money and they injure people, what in the world is that in relation to somebody in California that fired, filed a frivolous lawsuit if that occurred? There's no justification. You know, I looked in the Constitution, and actually because of my love for it, I've read the document a bunch of times, and you know what's not in there? Somebody stood on this stage in 2017 and talked to you all about this subject, and he knew more than I did, so I'm not going to belabor, belabor the point. But arbitration is not in there. You can't buy a car, you can't get a mortgage, you can't get a credit card without an arbitration clause, and you will not win. You won't win in arbitration. So jury trials, according to Thomas Jefferson, are the greatest invention man has ever known to keep government in place, to keep the majority from stepping on the rights of the minority, from keeping the rich from trampling the poor, and keeping the majority from able to be taken advantage of by the minority. And they put that right in the Seventh Amendment of the United States Constitution, and we all have that, but the United States Supreme Court and different judges and legislatures have told you that if you go to arbitration, that's the same as jury trial. Except you can't win in arbitration because it's bought and paid for justice by the other side. You can make a difference. You can stand up for those things. There is a, I want to say, a poster child for frivolous lawsuits. I'm going to talk to you for a moment about that poster child. How many of you have heard about, you don't have to raise your hands, just kind of shake your head, but how many of you heard about the McDonald's case? Oh, yeah. Everybody knows hot coffee burns you, right? How could a woman get a million dollars for being burned by hot coffee? McDonald's did a publicity stunt about that to try to influence all of you, and it was immensely successful and it caused frivolous lawsuits to be part of the vernacular all over America. But guess what? Let me tell you about the actual facts of that case. McDonald's, in the district where the woman got burned, had 60 cases of first degree burns in their coffee in the year before. Why? <laughs> McDonald's kept their coffee at 195 to 205 degrees. I'm not a chemist, but I think Coffee boils similar to water at 212 degrees, so it's almost at boiling. You know what the other fast food franchises and convenience stores keep their coffee at? 155. 155. Somebody's seen hot coffee, right? <laughs> 155. You get burned, but you don't get first degree burns. You don't get scalded. Woman is, McDonald's knew that. McDonald's also didn't train their drive through people about coffee and hot beverages. They have been told you're keeping your coffee too hot and you're causing people to have to go to the hospital because first degree burns you have to get skin grafts and you have to go through that peeling process and you have a lot of medical. 
76 year old lady's going through the drive through with her grandson and she gets a cup of coffee. It's filled to the brim and the McDonald's employee doesn't put the lid on tight. He hands it to the grandson and miraculously the grandson doesn't spill it, but he hands it to the, the grandmother and she squeezes the cup. What happens when you squeeze a cup that's filled to the brim and the, the coffee comes out, right? It spilled on her lap and it scalded her and she spilled the whole cup. And I'm not gonna tell you what happened, but it melted her clothes into the private parts of her body. And she had $60,000 worth of skin grafts. She hired a lawyer, they went to McDonald's and they asked for the $60,000 in medical cost. McDonald's told them to pound sand. Everybody knows hot coffee burns. You don't spill it, lady. That's all you gotta do. Well, they found out, they filed suit when McDonald's wouldn't respond to them. They found out that McDonald's had burned 60 other people, that their coffee was too hot. And they went, McDonald's never offered a penny in settlement. They went to jury trial. And you know what the jury did? The jury found that the woman and her grandson was 40% at fault. They awarded over a million dollars. They were asked for six million, the amount McDonald's saved every year in that district. 195 to 205 degrees, apparently, and I don't understand the chemistry of it, but apparently coffee doesn't get the burn taste as much as it does at a lower temperature, so you saved money on coffee. And they saved six million dollars a year. So they didn't give them that six million, they gave them a million and she only got 60% of that. The only thing I think the jury got wrong was I think McDonald's was 90 to 95% at fault, not 60%. But the jury system worked. But you know what McDonald's did with their PR campaign? The woman died six years later. You know what she was doing when she died? She never left her house because she was the McDonald's coffee lady, the frivolous lawsuit lady. The woman who got a million dollars from McDonald's because she got burnt by hot coffee that everybody knew was hot. You know, that's what we turned into. We listened to that and we all think, well, she didn't deserve anything because hot coffee and we never look behind the scenes at what are the facts. Let me tell you some other few little war stories about what I do. I started trying cases in the Bakken in North Dakota because I tried more oil field cases than anybody in the history of the world, and I was pretty good at it. And I had gone to the plaintiff's side, and the first case that I tried in the Bakken, there were three injured workers. They were all first degree burns. You know how, why they got burned? Over $10,000. The largest operator in North Dakota is a company out of Oklahoma, and if I mention their name, you'd all know them because they're big political donors, because if you donate to the politics, you can affect the outcome. That's why you're important. <coughs> How they control pressure, which is the worst thing on an oil and gas location when you're drilling, the pressure of the gas coming up, because gas is, and oil is what? Flammable? You have blowouts, people get hurt. How you control it is with your drilling fluid. This company cut corners. They saved $10,000 by when they're coming. They, the whole time they drilled this well, they had what's called kicks, pressure coming out. So they've got three days left to get out of the hole. And they have another well being drilled. And they can take the drilling mud from this well and send it to the other well and save $10,000. That's what they did. They got a kick. The crew came in and said, we need to shut the well in, we need to circulate it out. He said, well, you don't have any mud, but it'll do that. I've heard that comment about 10 times now from people who burnt people up or blew them up. It'll do that. So what did they do? They kept going, and what happened? They exploded, and they gave three people, got first degree burns, had to have skin grafts. I have to correct you. It's gotta be third degree, not third. Third, you're, you're right, I'm sorry. It's third degree, not first degree. First degree is not as good, it's not as severe as third degree. I, I'm, and thank you very much for that because I, in trying to go fast and look at my time, I'm in combine these, yeah, it's third degrees. And that's what happened to the woman at McDonald's. She didn't get first degree, she got the third degree because she got her, her, her clothes actually melted into her skin. 
So I appreciate that. That makes me look like an idiot, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Thank you for it. So $10,000. The other thing that happened on that well is the people that drill the well, the faster you drill it, the more quicker you get into production. They were drilling that well, and they were making a record in North Dakota. It was the fastest well that ever been drilled until they had the blowout. Then they didn't complete it in time, and the guy didn't get the, the bonus. But the $10,000 cost three people. They'll never work in the oil field again. They'll never be able to go out in the sun. They have pain all the time. They were a year in the hospital. And it was all over $10,000. I thought, my gosh, you can't get any worse than that. Then I got a call from a family in Wisconsin. And every year I get reminded of this because every year on his birthday, this 19-year-old on the second day on the rig got burned up. He had worked two days. This one was over $280 in five hours. They were a workover crew, and they were supposed to have killed the well because they didn't have any way to control the well if it came in. So it was supposed to be dead. The day before, they would put $150 of brine water in, and they were waiting for another tanker truck that cost $280 and it was going to be a five hour delay and the company said go ahead and work. The well's killed. We don't need to do that extra safety precaution of that five hours and two hundred eighty dollars. That well blew out. The 18, the 18 year old in the derrick was burnt alive. Another person on the floor is burnt alive. Third person lost his legs and he got a settlement and they said oh man he got a lot of money. Two years later, he committed suicide because he couldn't live without his legs, and his life was miserable. My second client, after the family of the 19 year, 18 year old, was the guy that was the operator, and he got first degree burns. Third degree. God, I'm going to get that right wrong all day long. Uh, correct me every time I do that. He got third degree burns, but. You know what, he told me before his deposition, he goes, Justin, I'm going to tell him I shouldn't have gone forward. I should have stopped it. I should have, the, I am tortured every night. I don't sleep, I have nightmares, because these men under my charge were killed. That young man was on his second day, and he died and his parents will never see him again, and it's my fault. It's not your fault, Doug. It's not your fault. You were doing your job. You told them, and they told you to go ahead. But that's what the industry does, and they blamed him to this day. He took responsibility for the fact that he didn't override their business decision. Is that right? And he got burnt, too. Every September, I get an invitation from the family for that the 18 year old to come to a fishing tournament because he was a big fisherman and all his life on his birthday he had a fishing tournament and they carry on that tradition and every every September I'm tortured by that because I can't no matter what I do money wise I can't bring that young man back to life and he was killed over two hundred and eighty dollars in five hours I have a case going on right now in, uh, outside of the Dallas area that is a little different than the maim and destruction I just talked about. And I want to tell you about this because it's another way that big oil is affecting all of us. This is a rural area outside of Dallas. Most of these people make a living by growing livestock and vegetables, and they sell them in the community. I represent a young family that had moved out to the country to start a new life with their kids. They were raising prize goats and their daughter had a pony, a horse. It was a good life for them. Then they started getting sick. There was a well drilled 100 yards away from them. 
The people that lived on the land where the well was drilled, they got sick, and the people between them moved away because they were getting sick. Then one day, the young daughter goes out to the pond on their property, and her horse is dead in the pond. He was drinking the water. And then there are 12 goats that were the prize of their family and each were $13,000, which was the most money they had for their net worth. $100,000 worth of show goats. They all died from drinking the water. They're all sick. And what we found out is the chemicals from that well got leached into the groundwater and got into that pond. And in all states, when they drill a well, they're supposed to make sure the surface cement, which protects the groundwater, protects the livestock, protects the vegetation, the vegetables, with the fruit, the, all we all eat. It protects our yards so that our kids aren't playing in grass that is poisoned. $5,000 is what caused this mayhem. They could have spent $5,000 extra and they made sure they had the right surface cement job. I don't want to stop the oil and gas industry from providing jobs. I don't think we could live in Phoenix without air conditioning in the summer especially. And I live in Texas and we, I sometimes say it wouldn't be hospitable if we didn't have air conditioning. But what I want to do is take a little bit less in the profits. Don't cut the corners. Don't do the $10,000 three days early. Don't do, do five hours and $280 and kill three people and maim another one who's, you know, my client Doug, he'll never have a life because he can't get away from his thought that he should have done something. But you know that oil company, I got another case against them and I asked them, did you change anything? Because my client now got hurt two months later. They said, no, we didn't change anything because we knew pressure killed beforehand. We knew you had to treat pressure as dangerous beforehand. Why do I have to answer your questions about this other case? We all know these people died and it was a tragedy. It wasn't our fault. So because it's exactly that, you're saying that none of this is your fault, so I'm asking you these questions about, did you learn anything from the first time? I don't think they did. I talked to you a little bit about individualism and exceptionalism and why it matters to each of you. All of you are exceptional or you wouldn't be here in certain ways. But all of you as individuals matter and we all matter as individuals. I told you a little bit that I, I had a cancer battle. I had some neuropathy in my feet and I have, a, um, I have a problem with the nerves. And so I, I had a gift a number of years ago that I'd never worn very much of custom cowboy boots where I was fitted for them and I uh, had become a little bit of aficionado, but I was told by the uh, a podiatrist that the boots, the heel, were supposed to walk on the front of our feet and, it, and that the shafts provide support for our ankles and so our feet don't get as tired if you wear shoes like that or boots like that. I met a guy who is the best in the world at what he does. His name's Lee Miller. He lives in Austin, Texas. And if you ever heard a gentleman out of New York and He's born in New York, but he's I say he was raised in Texas. He became popular in Texas, named Jerry Jeff Walker. In 1970, he wrote a song about an Irish imp bootmaker named Charlie Dunn. If you have a chance, look up Charlie Dunn, the song. Lee Miller is from Vermont, and he apprenticed with Charlie Dunn. Charlie Dunn was called the Michelangelo of bootmakers. He was about 5'6", and he wore this Picasso hat, and he was a character. But Lee Miller has, has, a, has done a lifetime of studying people's feet. And Charlie Dunn did a, a uh, I was told, did a correspondence course with Dr. Scholes. How many of you had a Dr. Scholes, uh, something you put in your feet? Well, he actually could diagnose the problems with your feet by feeling them. Well, Lee does the same thing. 
Down the street from Lee, and I convinced Lee to make me a pair of cowboy boots because I gave him this sad story and I sold him on the fact that I'd had this cancer battle and he, and he was the only person who could fit me for boots and it kind of, so he and his wife are the nicest people in the world and so they're making me some boots. Well, I'm over to the shop and I'm talking to him because I like to hang out there and Lee is a neat person and we're talking about a company down the street and this is the difference between you as individuals and you as a member of a group. This company has started out and they did a market research and they found out there was a untapped market for cowboy boots and western wear and leather goods and they could go to Mexico and they could get these craftsmen to make them and they could sell them for good prices and they, the first year they made $10, 10 million dollars in sales, the second year 30, the third year 60. This year they're supposed to make over a hundred million dollars in sales and almost half of that's profit. And so I said, Lee, have you ever thought about that? He said, yeah, we could hire a bunch of boot makers. I could sell 20 million dollars worth of boots. It'd almost be all profit. In five years, my wife and I would be wealthy and we could retire. But he said, you know what the problem with it would be? And I said, I hope you don't do it because I want boots made by you. He said, that's it. They wouldn't be Lee Miller boots. They wouldn't be the best in the world. That's what each of us, whether you do something that you're, you don't have to be the best in the world at it, but when you do it, you're you. You're you as a parent, you're you as a child, you're you as a brother, a sister, a husband, or wife, you're you as a worker. And why is death such an equalizer? Because the person that we lose we will never be able to have that relationship with that person again. They're gone. You can replace them with another friend. You can't replace your mother or father, or your sister, your brother, your husband or wife or your child. But another friend can be replaced. But you won't have that friend who relates like that. That's why each of us is important. And why does that all tie together? Because, you know, oil companies, insurance companies, government, they advertise, they, they categorize, they put us in boxes and they control us. The message to you as the smartest people in the room, don't let them do that. Think for yourselves, look behind the advertising, look behind hot coffee burns, look behind oil is good for us because it makes us all comfortable. It does. I don't want to lose air conditioning. I don't want to lose the ability to fly a jet. I don't want to lose the ability to go from one place to the other. But what I don't want to do is have humans suffer because of it. We can do both if we will hold them accountable and we don't let them control us. How many of you ever heard of something called peer review? It's a medical, a lot of you have heard it. I'm going to talk about a medical peer review. It's a good thing. It's where doctors judge other doctors. You know, is there one good thing the insurance industry can't screw up? I represented a doctor in Corpus Christi, Texas, and all of you, if you've been hospitalized or know anybody's hospitalized in the last 10, 15 years, you have come across this particular program. It's called the Hospitalist Program. Let me tell you how it started. It was introduced by the, one of the largest health insurance companies in the nation. And the way they introduced it was that Corpus Christi, Texas, my hometown, to 57 general practitioner doctors. And here's how they came up with that plan. They told them, we're going to make your life better. When your patients go to the hospital, you don't have to get up at five in the morning, go see them and do your rounds. We're going to hire doctors who are called hospitalists who work for us, the insurance company, who all we all know have their best interests at heart, right? <laughs> they're going to work for the insurance company and they're going to take away you having to do that job. So you won't have to do it anymore. 57 doctors all sat there and said, gosh, this sounds like a great idea. I won't have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. One doctor said, 
wait a minute, and stood up. I don't know about you, my friends, but in Texas, abandoning your patients is malpractice. And if you turn your patients over to the insurance company, you have committed malpractice and I for one won't do it. That happened on a Wednesday night, on a Thursday night, on Friday night, the insurance company put him on an insurance company peer review. Said he was a bad doctor and they were doing it to protect the community. Let me tell you the story of this lawsuit. It was a seven week case I tried in Corpus Christi back in 2000, 2000, 2000? I think it was 2000. Here's what happened. The way the peer review worked was they had these seven doctors, two of which were employees of the insurance company. That sounds fair, right? And they had a medical director who was the medical director for the insurance company and he would go to the peer review and find out what they wanted, then he would go to the doctor and tell the doctor, this is, what, this is the way it's supposed to work. This is what they want you to do. Well, the first night, the peer review said, we've been looking at the medical records and we'd like to see these five files. The medical director goes to the doctor and said, you know what, they looked over your records and you're doing better. He didn't ask him anything about the five files. This goes on for six months. Medical, the peer review says, where are these records? The medical director says, doctor, you're doing good. Then the medical director, you know what he tells the peer review? The doctor's not providing us any information to provide to you. Guess what? Those peer review records are privileged, and that's a good thing generally. Generally, there should always be an exception, especially when insurance is involved, right? We couldn't get them. I took the medical director and the, and the executive director and I said, I don't give a rat's ass about your peer review records. I'm going to beat you anyway. And so they said, well, they show he's a bad doctor and they turned him over to us. And we looked at him and we said, oh my gosh, they're not telling the truth to anybody. The standard to beat a peer review is fraud and malice. We beat that standard. The judge let us go to the jury. Here was two things, the testimony of the son who was a doctor, and it's especially important to me because I practice law with my two sons and I'm very proud of them. They're good lawyers and they're good, they're good sons, they're good men. This son goes to his parents' house at 11, 11.30 at night and he sees his father who's been practicing medicine for 30 years. This is a doctor who was the first Anglo doctor in Corpus Christi, Texas to see Hispanic patients. He may not be the greatest doctor in the world, but he was my doctor. He is sitting in his living room surrounded by medical records, looking at his medical records at 11, 11.30 at night, and he's softly sobbing because they've taken all his patients they peer reviewed him and they found him guilty of not complying and being a bad doctor and they took his patients. What he did, the case showed, was they appealed it, it was overturned and they peer reviewed him again and they took all his patients and they didn't let him appeal and they gave 425 of his patients to one doctor who was on the peer review, worked for the insurance company and four of them, 25 to the other doctor and they built them a practice and they have loyalty, total loyalty to the insurance company. <coughs> At mediation, they told us they were protecting the community and he had committed 387 cases of malpractice that they had records of. We went to trial for seven weeks and you know how many cases they told us? There were five. And of those five, guess what? My doctor wasn't in charge of four patients. There were specialists who worked for that insurance company and they didn't say the specialist did anything wrong. They said our doc my doctor did. The fifth patient, my doctor said I should have done something different because he had a heart condition and he, he, he gave him uh, medicine, gave him instructions told him don't exert yourself, don't go out in the sun. The guy went out and he mowed his yard in 95 degree heat and had a heart attack. And my doctor still took responsibility for that patient by saying I should have done something different. But he didn't commit 387 
acts of malpractice, and he didn't commit five. He might have been wrong on one. As a doctor with 850 patients, that was probably a pretty good record. But they took his, let's be, you know, everybody in this room knows why they put him on peer review, because he stood up against their cost-cutting program. He stood up for patients' rights, and he stood up against corporate America. One person out of 57. And you know what they taught him by putting him on that peer review? That those other 57 did right, because they didn't get tortured, they didn't lose their patients, they didn't have to go through all the hell he had to go through. It's not easy to be an individual. We sat in the room next door across the hall for a little while, uh, my wife and I, and we listened to a Holocaust survivor talking about the Holocaust. And one of the things he said is the most useless thing in the world is a bystander, and that bystanders allowed the Holocaust to happen. Each of you are people that don't need to be bystanders, but need to be people that give your voice to the issues you believe are important. I'm going to try to tie in big oil and all their big bad practices and insurance companies and the frivolous lawsuits and individual and exceptionalism. Let's see if I can get this together. In the doctor's case 30, 20 years ago now, I was able to be a good lawyer. What I had come to the conclusion of was that the top 5% of trial lawyers in America do what I do are plaintiff's lawyers. 95%, most of the other good lawyers are hired by big business, big oil, and big insurance. As a defense lawyer, I could beat 95% of the lawyers on the other side just because I was better than them. But what have the judges and the juries done? You know, I told you about that thousand zeros for every verdict of any kind, the 10,000 zeros for any million dollar verdict. Have you ever heard about me pouring out the family that got killed by the Greyhound bus and they didn't get a penny? Have you ever heard about the Chevron worker who I made a liar? You know, I feel bad about this this day. I tried the first case Chevron won in 20 years in Texas. And what had happened is this guy testified about something and I thought, you know, he's not telling the truth. I think now, 20 years later, he probably was. But you know what I said? I said, if you listen to what he said, he walked on water, and the only person I know has ever walked on water is Jesus Christ, and he's not Jesus Christ. And that resonated with the jury, and they poured him out. After the verdict, his lawyer looked down at him and said, you lost. He said, what happened? He pointed at me, said him. And the funny thing about that case is the lawyer told me later that the case had originated before I got brought into the case, it was with my original Blue Bud firm, and he said they would have paid him a million dollars. But I won that case on behalf of Chevron, and it has bothered me all this time. That wasn't one of those bad lawyers. He was a good lawyer. He just wasn't as good as I was. Chevron was ever able to hire the best and to spend mo more money than he was. And that guy is not living a good life to this day because I came up with an analogy that resonated with the jury. You never hear about that, how the defense lawyers do that. But this got publicity in the doctor's case, and I can't do this anymore, and this is why it's important to you. I stood up and I told the jury, it's the last thing they heard, I said, I've represented corporate America most of my life. I've represented Halliburton, I've represented Mobile, I've represented Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Westinghouse, the biggest companies in America. And I always thought, if I could just represent somebody like this doctor, that the eloquence I would have, the words that I would say would compel you as a jury to give justice to this man. I sit here today and I find I'm not worthy I don't have the words. I do not know what to say to you to tell you what he went through and what those people over there did to him because of money and power. But I just wish for once I was on the jury and I had your power to do right. Please come back with the verdict 
that will make him happy and will make you happy. And they did. Fast forward 20 years. Frivolous lawsuits, tort reform, lawyers on my side of the bar are taken out of it. They don't want us to voir dire the jury. That's where we get to ask the jury's questions. They don't want us to do that. Federal courts, some federal courts don't even allow us to do it. They don't let me use analogy anymore. I used to try my cases in voir dire by never talking about the case. The Chevron case I talked about, uh, I, I won a case, let me give you a, one maybe funny, hopefully funny story. I was hired by Westinghouse to try a case in Glen Rose, Texas, which is about 12 hours drive from Cor Corpus Christi. I was the last lawyer on a Monday to talk to the jury. Every other lawyer talked about Westinghouse had to go all the way to Corpus Christi to hire a lawyer because Westinghouse was at fault. So they had to hire this lawyer. They couldn't get somebody local. I got up at the end of the day. I said, I've, I, I'm the last person. I said, you know what? I've heard them talking about I'm from Corpus Christi all day long. I got a choice to give you. You can stay here a week and listen to all these other lawyers, or why don't you go home with me? We sit on the beach and listen to Jimmy Buffett and drink beer. Who wants to go with me? They all raised their hand. I said, the truth is, let me ask you a question. Why is it that every man in the room, when you put furniture in the house, will leave it wherever it is, and every woman will rearrange the furniture every six months? I said, everybody know that? The district clerk was on the jury panel, was in the front row, and she said, and this is very Texan, she said, hun, you're just never going to understand that. I said, <laughs> I said, thank you, ma'am, but can you explain it to me? Because I, I really do have a point, but I want to know, because I've never voluntarily moved a couch in my life, and I never moved a chair from one room to the other. Wherever it is, it looked good to me. And they all talked about it a little while. And I said, Westinghouse has these two gentlemen, and they're supposed to have taken this door apart and not put it back together again. And it's because they're supposed to have a toolbox that didn't fit through the door. Here's a picture right here. It's not really, but play like it is. It's a picture of a toolbox going through the door without them having to take it apart. How many of you people think that the Westinghouse took that door apart? to get that toolbox that fit through it, and then they had to put it back together. They all shook their head no. They dismissed Westinghouse that next night. If you go out in the marketplace because your toilet overflows, you want to get the best plumber you can get, right? If you go to the hospital, you want the best surgeon, you want the best doctor. If you go to an auto mechanic, I want the best auto mechanic I can find. What the juries, and or what the, not the juries, but the judges and the legislatures are doing is try to take me out of play so I can't represent my clients. They don't want, they say, justice is not served if the lawyers affect justice. That doesn't make any sense at all. You know, occasionally, most of the time, juries get it right. And even that Chevron jury may have got it right, and maybe I'm just too sympathetic to people, but I do think that at the time I believed in what I was doing, it didn't question that there, I did have the analogy right. I am passionate about what I do. I believe people who work in North Dakota in 20 degree below weather. I've tried three cases in Bismarck and in Williston where the weather was between minus 10 and minus 20. And I'm telling you, it was tough getting from my car to the courthouse. We talk about hot weather, but that cold is hard to work in. Those people work in those conditions so we can have air conditioning in Phoenix in the summer and we can drive our cars and do everything. It's important that we stand up for them. It's important that I'm allowed to stand up for them. It's important that we do what we can to allow the system to work. I proudly wear this seven 
because I believe in the Seventh Amendment. I think juries combined wisdom is very, very good. It's not the lowest common denominator in the room, it's the highest. I've never seen them really get it wrong badly. The McDonald's jury, you gotta give them one thing, they were fair to McDonald's. McDonald's didn't think so, but they really, what they found out, what they liked about it was it gave them a publicity stunt and they took full advantage of it. I hate TSA. I'm the worst TSA flyer there is. I'm always making snide comments, and you know what? They don't like it. <laughs> they always tell me that I'm endangering the other passengers, and I say that that's bull, that, they, you know, that you can go to Israel and they don't strip search everybody. You can go to Europe, they don't strip search everybody. I said, why don't we treat everybody as individuals? Why don't we look at who's dangerous and who's not? And they said, well, that, that, that is offensive. It's offensive because we're all people, we're, we are groups and it will offend certain groups. You know, I'm not for offending anybody. And if anybody is taking away from it that he says we need to offend everybody because we don't, you know, can't be a member of a group, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is individuals matter and if you're treated as an individual, then common sense takes place and you don't strip search everybody. You know, before they made everybody go through those things that are the, that are the mechanical or the, or the electronic strip searchers, my mother-in-law, who was in her 80s, would fly back and forth between Philadelphia and Corpus, and she was always pulled out of the line. Now, she was an 80-something-year-old Irish-American woman who lived all of her life in Philadelphia and didn't have a parking ticket. She was not exactly a good candidate for a terrorist because, first of all, she was physically not in good shape. And she didn't even carry a big purse with a bunch of stuff in it. There's no group that I know of better to give this speech to about what is important to me in protecting workers and the environment and landowners <laughs> from big oil and big insurance and making sure that we're each as individuals living an important life. Because if, you, it's, if those things aren't important to you, if they're not important to the people in this room, their dadgum sure not going to be important to the people out on the street. If you're not willing to stand up as an individual and you're not willing to say when somebody says, tort reform's a good thing because lawsuits cost us all money, that's not true. There's not a, you know, tell them to point you to the frivolous lawsuits that tort reform is, is, is curing. And they'll invariably, they'll tell you about the McDonald's case and how hot coffee burned that woman. Now you can know, somebody has seen that there's a video on, on YouTube called Hot Coffee where somebody finally just got enough of it and did the story. So if I got it wrong, I'm sorry because I've heard it before that Hot Coffee video was out. I heard about it when it first happened and I heard the facts and it was appalling to me that they were torturing the woman at the time. This was before, they, before she died. And then you see the story about she didn't leave her house. I thought, that's not, that's not the America I was born into. It's not the land I want to live in. It's not the land of the free. It damn sure ain't the home of the brave. But we can all change it. And if we don't, those people out there won't. So it's important to you, I hope, that I've shown you a little bit of the passion I have for what I do and that the things I think are important will be important to you. I want you to be able to, if you have a financial case where somebody has defrauded you from money, I want you to get the best lawyer you can get. And go, if it's Chase Bank, I want you to skin their rear. I don't want you to have to go to arbitration where Chase Bank has paid for somebody to tell you that you lose or you get, you can win. Mr. Smith, you're going to win, but that, that, that $40,000 in life savings, we're going to award you $7.50.
That ain't fair. It isn't, it isn't the Seventh Amendment. And nowhere in the Constitution does it say that arbitration is a substitute for the right to jury trial, for the combined wisdom of your fellow citizens. If you don't stand up for these rights, you'll lose them. People, they're not teaching civics anymore. They're not teaching government. Everything is advertising. The news is not Walter Cronkite. I mean, all of you probably remember him, but I, my kids don't know who Walter Cronkite is. Just sitting there reading the news, that's not what they do now. There's not one news channel that doesn't give you their opinion. It doesn't matter whether you believe their opinion on one side or believe it on the other. They're still giving your opinion. They're still controlling you and controlling your individuality. But you don't have to let them. Think for yourself. Stand up. And be counted. I have, according to my phone, going on 12 minutes left. And I have gotten to the end of my outline of two speeches combined. So what I'm going to do for 12 minutes is let, oh, this is dangerous with this group. I'm going to open it up for questions for 12 minutes. You've got 12 minutes of questions. Ma'am, you're on front, and then and we're going to go from front to back. We'll go up and down the roads, and I'll try to answer them in 12 minutes. Tell me. The oil company's personal responsibility. The driller didn't shut a valve. They didn't shut down. They didn't stop. The guy, Doug, that I told you about, Doug didn't exercise. Every oil field worker has something called stop work authority. And I have the best oil field expert in the business, a guy out of Dallas, Texas. And he testified for Halliburton in the Deepwater Horizon. And Halliburton won every issue he testified on. He's the best. He says nobody in the history of the oil field has exercised stop work authority on a serious case because they'll fire them. They'll run them off. But they tell them, you can stop work if it's dangerous. You're ex and you know what they say? We expect you to stop work. But on Doug's case, they had already told him to go to work. They were five hours late with getting the $280 worth of brine water there. They said, go ahead. The well's killed. So what was he supposed to do? But they blame the worker. And they say, you've got to stop work authority, or they find something that the workers did or didn't do. Or if that doesn't work, guess what? Have you lived a perfect life? I got a client that uh, recovered, made $100,000 in the oil field and the company was using the wrong equipment, they dropped 1,800 pounds of pipe on his head, almost killed him. He's, his face is disfigured, his jaw is crushed. He will never, ever be able to eat a steak, drink a beer, or have sexual relations with his wife. The rest of his life, and he was 38 years old, and they said it's his fault. Because 10 years earlier, he'd been in a car wreck, and he'd been in a coma, and all of his brain damage is from that place. Even though he, he worked uh, and made $100,000 the year before and was a, uh, never had a problem, but they've gone back throughout his life filming anything they can do. He also had, he's in Colorado, he, he had a drug issue. Oh my God, you know everybody in Colorado has some kind of drug issue, right? <laughs> If you don't, we'll give you one, right? <laughs> so they blame him for all that. So he's not entitled any, or he's entitled to limited. It will cost life care planners. Has anybody ever heard of a life care plan where they, okay, you know what it is, where they take and they plan out how much it's going to cost you in medical care, in nursing, in transportation, the rest of his life? Well, his life care plan is $6.8 million. They've never offered half of that because they say, we're going to pour him out because the jury's never going to give any money to him because of a drug, uh, you know, he used drugs once. I just tried a case in North Dakota for a lifetime drug addict that started smoking pot on Malibu in California. Imagine that, when he was nine years old. By 16, he was doing cocaine. By 25, he was doing heroin. He became, uh, and we made a mistake, and we 
thought that the jury would like the fact that he started working with drug addicts, but he, uh, he was a counselor with the Palmer Drug Abuse Association and was on their national board, and he, and he knew about addiction, and he fought it all his whole life. What that jury cared about was, was he using drugs at the time of the accident? Did it affect him getting hurt? And neither one of those things were true. He never failed the drug test. Didn't affect him in the same way with my guy that got his, pat, the, got his brain smashed by the pipe. Didn't keep him from thinking that they were never going to award him money because he wasn't worthy. They awarded him $4.5 million. Thank, thank God. Okay. Somebody else in the front row had a question? Second row, I know you have a question. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the McDonald's case? Uh, the presentation on the attorney did a splendid case record on it. So we got a McDonald's vice president on the stand. He said, Why do you make the coffee so hot? Well, 75% of the coffee goes out the side window. So we wanted hot so when people bought a cup of coffee when they got to the office, it was still nice and warm. And they said, well, knowing all these problems, the cases have burned, what are you going to do about it? He said, nothing. I think that kind of goose the jury a little bit in a positive way. But the McDonald's was very cavalier on the whole thing. Yeah, they, they were extremely cavalier. All these companies are cavalier. They don't believe. They think that the tide has turned and that everybody like you hates people like me. Two years ago, the person that was giving this speech was talking about arbitration, punitive damages, and uh, uh, judicial elections. And he got a question about, what about, don't these companies have the right to defend themselves because of frivolous lawsuits and scum-sucking lawyers like you who make millions of dollars? Well, I wanted to answer that question. So I'm gonna answer it today. I represented those companies and there weren't any of those frivolous lawsuits that I ever saw. Start with even the ones that I won, some of them I thought should have gone the other way. But that's number one. Number two, how much money did the company spend? Those frivolous lawsuits, guess who pays for them? The lawyer has to front the cost. Lawyers don't economic survival. You cannot fund bad cases because the other side will outspend me every time. You know what my average oil field call, case cost? It cost out of my pocket $250,000 to represent each worker. And you think I'm filing bad lawsuits and losing $250,000? I ain't got that kind of money. And my wife isn't going to let me do it either. So that doesn't happen because they can outspend you. And exactly what you said, sir, is true. They have a cavalier attitude about it because they think they have created a public image that there is a crisis in lawsuits and that lawyers advertising that, you know what? When I started out, lawyers weren't able to advertise. But here's one of the strange things. When I was a defense lawyer, I went to London to take a deposition in a case involving Westinghouse. And we, my, one of my partners joined me because we represented some of the syndicates at Lloyd's at that time and we were going to entertain them. And we couldn't find any of the Lloyd's adjusters. You know why? A New Orleans, Louisiana firm had chartered a jet and taken almost everybody in London to Ireland for five days of all expense paid golf. They blame us for advertising on TV? How, does, how do you know who's a good lawyer, who's at the top of their profession, and who is advertising that they're good? In Texas, there's a lawyer. I, I, I'm digressing into the minutia, but let me tell you this, because it's important. I had a case that a partner of mine tried, and he got $21 million from Coke for text. Uh, uh, somebody for Coca-Cola was texting while driving and ran into this woman. Well, this lawyer had the case, and he referred it to my partner. I wrote the closing argument. My partner tried the case, and he advertised he got the verdict. And so everybody thinks he's a good lawyer. Nobody knows. So if we don't... I don't have a website and tell you what I do. 
if I don't come to this conference and give this speech, then nobody knows who's the good lawyer. Because the lawyers know, but they ain't telling. 